Hey guys, welcome to the Lee Chandler podcast, the commercial finance podcast. And today we're going to talk about alternative investing. But I need you guys to first get pen and paper and listen very closely because we have an amazing guest speaker today. His name is Andy McMullen. All right. So without any further ado, because we've been talking for quite a bit already, and uh, Andy has been, uh, as, as, as we would say on a basketball court, dropping some dimes. All right. So... <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, Andy, can you introduce yourself to uh, everyone who's listening? Yeah, man, I'm a big fan. My, my dad was a basketball coach. I was always like a, a, a half a step slower, right? And I, I could, I could, but I had broken down tape many times with him. We called it tape back then, I guess. Um, but, you know, my, my background is uh, about 20 years in real estate. I started off on the brokerage side, kind of commercial brokerage. And, uh, and then I kind of, I, I, I sauntered into my, my mentor's office one day and I was kind of just making, you know, measly commissions. I'd have big months and then I had really slow months and his office assistant walks in and she hands him his distribution check. And I didn't even know about this deal. It was like Irwindale fund three or four or whatever. And it, I just looked down and I went, Oh man, I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong business. Right? Like he had passive income coming from, all different phases. So anyways, I, I started to kind of uh, to phase into more development and kind of uh, partnering up with people and buying apartment buildings. And uh, that's kind of how we started our, you know, our business. And now we've been in California and, and multiple states, uh, hopefully, you know, helping other investors and in transforming some of these communities in those in those uh, areas. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So you mentioned California. So that's obviously going to come back up on the radar today. <laughs> yeah, like I should be the only one that can talk about California that way, man. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's not a person I talk to that just, they, they don't, they just look at me funny. You know, uh, I got, I got my roots here. I got my family here. I grew up and went to college in LA, all that stuff. And I still wake up every morning and wonder why I'm still here. <laughs> So speaking, speaking of, right, that's kind of going into the failures. Tell us about some failures and some success and uh, what you've been doing. Yeah, you know, um, I, uh, one, of, one of the just the horrific deals that I had was one of my first syndications. I, I, I thought I knew a lot more than I did. Um, I thought also that I uh, was really good at kind of communicating these ideas to some of the people in working in these areas. And the truth was that one, I was a Californian. I should have been going into Texas and telling the Texan how to do anything, right? Uh, and, and the second thing is that I just bit off a lot more than I could chew. We had some bad luck. We had a, uh, it was like a mixed use property. We had one of our major tenants that was probably paying, a, you know, forty percent of the rent roll at that point, and just usury laws. Texas came and said, "Hey, look, you guys can't do title." Uh, car title companies anymore and then in the middle of the night they just they up and left right and so that was within like the first six months of our deal and so I would say over the last five seven years for the next five or seven years we were trying to fill every hole and it was everything from understanding that all these contractors all these subs they don't care about your property as much nope. as you do um, and if you aren't keeping watch Things are going to happen, and and that and I, I I should even put that on them, right? Because there were there were hundreds of things that I sucked at, just as far as you know, underwriting the property, getting multiple bids, uh, you know, kind of understanding the value of teams, right? Um, the investor relations piece, you know, part of what what separates us now is is that we really focus on the investor experience, and I know as an operator back then that the last thing I wanted to do on a Sunday night was pull down reports from asset management and property management and contractors and write something, you know, that made any sense to the investors. So um, we could dig a little bit deeper into those deals and failures, but I mean, that was one that I probably learned, you know, I don't know, there was probably 200 mistakes I, I made in that one. And then luckily we did get out. I had a, I had a good loan. So as, as your investors probably know, the loan pay down on, on a lot of these deals is really key, you know, with the ways that you can make money in real estate. And so, uh, you know, though that they were handing deals to 
dummies like me, like Tic Tacs back then, it did make sense for us to have, you know, uh, we were able to turn it around, you know. That's good. That's good. Um, and something that people may not think of from your from your story, your experiences is you knew that you still had to communicate with those investors. And that's a big mistake that people make is they just don't communicate with, with their investors. You know, one thing I've seen in like the last 10 years, and you guys know the, the sports analogies that you were talking about dimes, uh, you know, like winning's the best deodorant, right? So yeah. <laughs> if, if, over the last 10 years, you know, you were a syndicator, an operator, you found a deal, you executed a deal, maybe even exited successfully. And, but the cruise itself, the experience was terrible for the investors. It doesn't mean a whole lot, right? Because, you know, there was a, there were, there were people that were making money in spite of themselves, um, despite themselves. So I think that uh, now is kind of where the rubber meets the road, where you really, if, if, if you're getting back to your investors with, hey, here's what's really problematic about, about our deals. And that's, that's something that I love investing with people like that, that will just tell you exactly how it is. And here's the solution. Um, because every single person who's done deals, whether it's real estate or some other investment, understands that we don't know what's going to go wrong yet, but there's going to be something that's going to go wrong, right? And so it is about that jockey that you've got there kind of, you know, running yep. the show. And Andy, just real quick, say the word yet one more time. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> something always goes wrong. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, there's, there's, I've never had a deal. I was talking with a lender today, earlier this morning. There's never been like a smooth close, even for her, right? She's she's got all the docs and she knows exactly how to, these transactions work. But th but there's there's going to be pieces that will unravel, and they just got to have people in place with processes that can can minimize them. But you also got to have somebody that can actually rein it back in when it starts to get off off track. That's good. That's really good. And you mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned your mentor, right? Um, how monumental was that? I mean, what, what did you, what did you learn from him that actually propelled you forward? Yeah. So I, I've been blessed with, with, uh, with a few mentors in my life, but this particular mentor that I mentioned, um, I was so unfocused, Leland. I, 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 um, I came in, I was, I, I was really good at making relationships, you know, he, he would, he would, he would bring me in and he would say, Hey, you know, you know, you're, 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 you're obviously good at, in relationships you know people like you you're bright but you have there like this file that you put together or this email that you sent out to investors like this is going to lose you not just a little bit of money but a, a lot a lot of money and he knew like even even to, he passed uh, uh too early even the last kind of book that he wrote me uh like he, in the inside of the cover he gave me uh seneca you guys familiar with seneca he's a Stoic philosopher, but but just wisdom, uh, um, incredible wisdom. But but it, it, his, the thing that he wrote to me was, for for a man who does know uh, does not know to which uh, which port he is sailing, no wind is favorable. Like that was his last kind of what he wrote to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he kind of knew he was going to be, he was he was on his way out. I think he he knew he was going to be be with him, but. Uh, that, that stuck with me. And I'm so grateful that he did that because one, that book is full of those kinds of stoic, you know, uh, philosophies to rein me back in when my like natural entrepreneurial, you know, uh, shiny, shiny object syndrome kind of comes into place. Mm -hmm. um, so those, so those are, those are kind of some things that I learned from him. Other things that I learned were how to, just how to lead. Because like I, we got to earlier, things are going to be wrong. Things are going to go wrong. You start yelling at your people. You start, you know, complaining that it's everybody else's fault. They're not, they're not going to do a single thing for you. Right. And so you really kind of start to respect people when you see how they can handle that adversity and, and, you know, not to say that they don't have an emotional outburst here or there, but, but, but for the most part, they're focused on what they're going to achieve and they're trying to rally. They're trying to lead from the bottom up, you know, not from the top down, but like what, what kind of resources can I give to everybody else to keep this thing? I'm, I feel like I'm droning on, but you guys. Get no, 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 you're, you're perfect. And, and something that Hank and I have talked about in the past is uh, 
when we look at you know studying other uh, entrepreneurs and things like that, we see that they understand the importance of motivating their team instead of necessarily getting a payout for themselves. And that in itself builds mo momentum to have the, the bigger payouts or the bigger wins down the road. Yeah, we, we try to say that, that hey, look, I, our, for our management team, our leadership team, that we're, we're servants, right? Like there's, there's no way that we can get anywhere if we're trying to lead from, you know, in, instruction. Or, it's got to be a, an inner belief that they want to feel part of it. It's like the best, you know, I, I always use a lot of sports analogies, but the, the best teams that you remember, like they always talk about some culture, right? There's heat culture. You remember like the Dallas teams, you know, that, that maybe, you know, is Jason Terry really a number two on a championship team? Absolutely there's not. Something, <laughs> there's something about it, the culture. No, of course not. Right. But there's something about he had Dirk had all these other weapons that kind of filled around him. Um, you know, even some of those heat teams that lot. So anyways, I just think that there's something really to that. And it, it does come from a leader and it can't only be the, the COO or the COO. It's kind of got to be a, a everybody kind of. And then the other thing is taking things personal. That's, that's always a really tough thing for people to get to, you know, we, we've got a, a culture of, you know, kind of that radical transparency and that doesn't fit for everyone. And I know, I, I know why it does it too. Cause I, you know, there's been times where I've been sensitive on things too, but, but that, but you can't really get things to the fore if you can't really talk openly about it, you know? Yeah. Those kind of things are tough for men particularly. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's part of the reason that there's so many, you know, better women CEOs, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. Hank, there was something you wanted to say? Well, I, I was just sitting here and, I, you know, and he, here, here he is dealing with alternative investing. And he's talking about, about relationships and leadership. You know, so some of the touchy feely things that many successful, we're getting back to it, men um, don't even consider. They don't think that they are necessary pieces of the, of the puzzle of life, yeah. you know, and they treat people with disdain and disrespect, um, uh, it, you know, so I'm just sitting here listening. Here you are, a successful individual who've been in the, in the, you know, been in the game for over 20 years, and you're talking about some of the humanistic aspects of of making of making money um what what you know you had a mentor but there had to be in my opinion there had to be something else maybe maybe he had the opportunity to shake you but oh, there yeah, was some yeah. foundational stuff there to oh talk yeah about. man like you know we'd have these things in his office where i mean i just dreaded going in there right but going i just dreaded going in there with my folder or you know, talking through, he, he had such smart questions too, right? And a lot of times, if we really think about it, we're not really necessarily being honest with ourselves. We, if we think about every bro breakup that we've ever had, we never told her what the reason that we broke up with her for, right? Like, there, there's always <laughs> something else, you know? Um, but, but, but I think that was part of it is that, that he just kind of had these real, these real specific questions that, are you really going to be honest with yourself? And then the other part for me is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a man of faith. And so I've always kind of felt my biggest battle always is going to be with me, right? It's always going to be with okay. me. And, okay. and that only, you know, there's only other people that, that, if, that I can serve, that I can help, that ultimately maybe it comes back around, maybe it doesn't. Um, but the journey is going to be a lot more fun that way. Um, and then also recognizing my shortcomings too, right? Like recognizing that part of it. Um, for many years, maybe even all the way till my late twenties, early thirties, I, I just still thought, Oh, I can do that. And then I go down, I get off that off ramp and, you know, I go down that road and I never, I don't come back, you know? And so mm -hmm. the focus part for me was such a, a big challenge. And I think it is for most people, if we're being honest, but um, especially for entrepreneurs like that, why, where else are we doing this unless we want to kind of build things do you do you consider yourself a risk taker? Uh, you know, like if if you said a uh, one or the other or die, I would say probably um, a little bit. I would say, you know, with with investments when we're when we're underwriting properties, we can't be right. We we have to be as conservative as possible. And a lot of people say that, but I'm talking about you know, having a, uh, 
expecting that prices are going to go down mm -hmm. in our underwriting, right? And if I'm just to simplify it, we call it a reversion cap rate. But basically, wherever the the market is today, we're we have to expect that it's going to go down, right? And that okay. we're still able to deliver those returns, or we have to expect that growth isn't going to be in Austin like it was the last. 10 years at seven or 8%, like we've got to expect that it's going to be closer to two or three. So when we're talking about other people's money, we can't afford to, but when I'm talking about the risk taking of like, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do this built to rent project. We've developed properties in Venice and LA. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of have to be a little bit of a, uh, I think that we're all kind of cynical. Yeah, yeah, but but like I think of like I think of coaches like before before Wooden won his first championship, was he really not good as a coach, or or was it just that over he had all these years right that he's kind of building all of these things and then he goes on this run, so I think about you know for me if there's one thing that I think I've been good at over the years which is you know maybe unimpressive for most people but it's just that kind of consistency okay. you know and then kind of seeing, well, there might be an opportunity for me. Like I've never been incredibly gifted in one single thing. You know, I think I'm, I'm good at building relationships, but never been completely, you know, gifted in one thing, but I have built habits, you know, to safeguard myself from, you know, getting off, off track. But yeah, like I've been in partnerships where I would say that those are a little bit more uh, uh, risk-taking. I mean, deciding to, to start a fund, I mean, like, you're, you know, you, you're basically a loser until you, you win one, right? Until so, you, until you purchase. Yeah. Um, the getting personal, what, what would be the dollar value of your most successful deal? Hmm. And what did you learn from your least successful deal? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you know what? I don't think I've been asked that before. So it's a really good question. Um, the, I'll tell you, I'll start with the least successful deal. I was paying, um, I, you know what? I, you mean, listeners might get something out of it, but it, it was a partnership that I had many years. He was an RIA, which is basically a registered investor and buyer. Probably one of those guys that you described earlier, I think before maybe even we started on the pod, Hank, which yep. is, you know, an institutional mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in 2009, when the market started to change, he was able to cheaply buy the Merrill Lynch brokers of the world just to build up his R RIA. And so he he built it up to about a billion dollars, um, which, you know, in, in that world is smaller, but 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 that's a lot of money. He's able to help a lot of people and there's maybe some philanthropy. But and I had known him for 15 years and we had partnered on this project. It was a multifamily, it was a mixed use project. I got a call one day that he had, he had taken his life. Ooh. And the next call I got was from his attorney. And his attorney said, he's being, he's being sued by St. Jude's, which is like an, another organization, you know, the, 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 is a, uh, the, not just the church, but this foundation. And he was being sued by, you know, Screen Actors Guild. And what we found out is that in basically 30 or 45, 60 days as the market started to kind of really collapse, he started to do things that I had never seen him ever do before, right? That he had basically wrapped up our property. This is a property that we own together, wrapped up our property in an LLC, put it in a fund for one of those entities. So now those entities are saying, hey, look, sorry, you know, sir's gone, but we've got to get our money from somewhere. Either it's going to be insurance or it's going to be you. So there were probably four years that it took in, 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 in basically legal fees, et cetera. And I think my lesson from that is that even though I had this great relationship, even though there was some trust there, I still didn't mind the store, you know, um, and I was paying legal fees with, and, and I had to pay back investors that I had on my side, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a there's a trust, but you know, they got they, they uh, Dover I no Provi, which is trust and verify, right. you know, it's got to be consistent, and you got to have systems in place that are kind of 
you know, checks and balances. And, and I didn't have that. And so we lost quite a bit of money in legal fees. I think, you know, in real estate, because there are so many ways to make money, you know, you've got your cash flow, you've got your appreciation that you're making money from, you're making money from the depreciation, you're mm -hmm. making money from the loan pay down, right? And then if you've got your your money in an, in, in an asset, you know, you're making money uh, from the bank by inflation, right? Because you've got your asset that they're paying the bills for basically. And every time that, you know, every year you're paying a little bit less in your loan. So because of that, you can, you can somewhat minimize risk, but like that was something that just blindsided me. And that leveled me to a point where I wasn't sure I was ever going to come back from it, uh, Hank, you know? Um, and, and, and on the, on the success side, I would say it's probably, you know, there's these deals that are maybe a double that they turn into a home run. And mm -hmm. the reason that they turn into a home run is basically a stroke in, of luck. And in, in the park home run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're basically, you know, that you think that, that they're probably going to be a single or a double. And then, you know, we, in one case, we had Google that just decided to move their offices right next door to a development that we had. Right. And so, yeah. you know, of course, that's going to push up prices. Of course, that pushes up. So there's things like that that are that are that are happening. But it's only if you're kind of prepared to be able to ride that wave when it comes, you know, it's called grace, grace. <laughs> That's right. No, no doubt. It's no doubt. That's why. I mean, that's what I named my my first daughter. Her middle name was Grace, just for that reason. That's beautiful. Wow. So, so Andy, um, you're mentioning a lot of learning and a lot of uh, success. Um, I guess at this point, we'll talk about the strategy and and what you guys are doing differently in the market right now from others. Yeah. So, so really, what we're we're trying to focus in. So, we've got a built to rent fund. Um, and there's, there's kind of a trend going on in, in real estate now. I think just in general, probably your generation, Leland has, you know, decided that maybe the American dream to own a picket fence is not what I really think of as the American dream. I want, you know, some freedom. I want, you know, I can, I can invest anywhere. I want to educate myself. Um, and that maybe me living in a nice place in an area that isn't right in the middle of the big city on top of somebody or having somebody jumping up and down above me that I can move into a nice rental house that is, that is new and has a backyard and has trails and has a dog park and storage and things like that. And then I could live there pretty, pretty close to what I'd be paying in a multifamily neighborhood. So there's some of these developments and, and our partner, our builder partner has been doing quite a few of these projects. So we, we recently, teamed up and we started our first project it's 100 units in Lafayette Louisiana and we're building uh you know these live these 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 built for rent communities and we really focus on the community um it's not just a oh aren't we great and magnanimous it's because we do believe that these residents that they think of it as their home the community if they if they like the people that they're living there with you know it benefits them and they stay longer and they refer people and the rent improves. And then on the other side, we can take care of the investors as a result of that. So those are the kinds of things that we focus on now. And then, you know, Hank, we talked a lot about the machinery of the business and trying to put all those pieces together and integrate them. That's kind of what we're, we're really focused on. Um, you, you were, you, you're talking about the, 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 the deal, the, the product, but to get to the product is a process. And that process is getting people to believe in the product to bring their money to the table to invest. Can you yeah, the, talk about that and what type of investors are we talking? What, what does it take to play in that arena? Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting, and I, I, I'm curious to hear what you guys' thoughts are on this, but I think most people, when they know, like, and trust somebody, they have an emotion on whether I'm going to invest first. Mm -hmm. It's emotional first. Mm -hmm. And then they will go back and they'll look at the underwriting to kind of rationalize, oh, yeah, that's why I did this deal. But if, if people are kind of looking at it honestly, it's a connection with the people that are that are manning the ship, right? And so 
for us, it's track. Right. Go ahead. What were you about to say? No, no, I'm, I'm agree. I'm agreeing with you. It's, it's, yeah. it, it might be, we might think it's an intellectual decision, but most of the time it's an, it's an emotional or, or gut reaction decision. It just feels right. And I don't know how to explain it other than it just felt right. When I joined Leland, you know, we had a cup of coffee, we had breakfast, and he said, blah, blah, blah. And it just, I said, yes. I mean, like, I don't know the guy. Okay. And it was one of the, and I tell him all the time, it was one of the best decisions that I've ever made. Now, just FYI, just everyone who's listening, I knew Hank a little, a little, a little more than just a cup of, cup of coffee. <laughs> well, I know, but I mean, we, you know, we, we had tried to do some, we had talked about doing some stuff. Okay, and again, my view in life is that you can be in the presence of someone and you don't really know who they are. Okay, you're presented with something, you can have a good conversation, you feel okay about them, but while you're having these conversations, you don't think that, hey, let me hook up with this individual to do something. That was never the conversation. You know, it, but, but somewhere along the line, I think there was an amazing mutual respect for one another where we felt comfortable and we could talk openly and honestly, not about deals, but about life. So I don't know whether that's, that's it though. Like that's what I was just going to ask you, Lee. I mean, you know, the amount of time that we spend in our day and work right it's mm -hmm. it's 16 18 some some days if we're really having to stretch it on 20 sometimes mm -hmm. but you gotta enjoy who you're there with right and and you've gotta you gotta feel like you're gonna grow with this relationship that there's some wisdom that's that hank's gonna have and there's some there's something that leland's gonna bring and and the people that they surround themselves there's not the bad actors that are coming in and potentially spoiling this thing that's gonna be building and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I won't pull out Bible with you, but I will just say that I had a really smart friend who said, hey, God, he first created the world. And then he said, it's, it's yours. Now your gift is to toil in it, right? Like this is your gift is mm -hmm. to do the work, right? And so the, if you should, you should enjoy your, your work. And if it's the people that, that aren't, and they'll usually fall out, right? Because they don't line with Hank. I'm curious to, you know, your values, you and your yeah. values. And you guys are about kind of building community and you want to work with these kinds of people. You know, they might not tell you, hey, that's not for me, but they'll fall off, right? Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. that's, just the, that's just the way that people really got to believe it and feel it in order to make it happen. You know, I'm curious to hear your take on it, Leland. Yeah, so one, you see, mentioned, Andy, you mentioned people falling off. Well, Hank's probably nodding his head because in our just meeting earlier today, he's 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 going to fire somebody on Monday. So mm. that 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 oh, that so this goes won't with, before Monday, right? So this, no, no. By the time by the, by the time the guy watches this, he already he already knows that this is re reference to him. But um, on a serious note, I agree. So and Andy, you may do this as well, but even with investors, you don't want to be with someone that's too eager, right? And the great thing with Hank is that he and I were able to meet. Actually, Hank and I, we, Hank and I would, would meet um, about once a week for breakfast, okay? And this took, this happened, I don't know, maybe a year or so, maybe two years. If it, well, and anyway, we'll meet once a week for breakfast, right? And all of us, all of us are married, so we all know how we would all court our wives, right? And I think for for invest well for investing, it's the same way, especially with investors who are looking to put their their money into their first deal, right? As uh, as, a, as a limited partner, and it's about building that relationship, having them making sure that they're comfortable with investing. Um, and so, long story short, I agree. The other thing is that because of television and everything else, social media and my generation as well, people think that things happen immediately. And a lot of times you have to build the relationship beforehand. You can still present an investor with what you're looking for, what you're hoping to happen. But, you know, for example, Andy, if the, if the houses aren't out of the ground yet, you can't say, hey, look, this is what we're, what we're going to do because it hasn't, hasn't been done yet. But you can say, hey, here's my track record. 
here are my partners, here's what they have done in the past, here's what we want to do, and we would love to have you um, a part of that. And that's the same thing that we do as husbands when we ask our significant others to, to marry us. We maybe said, hey, I want to give you the, the, the picket fence in the house. I don't have that right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm trusting that if, that, you know, if you come along in this journey, this is what, 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 we'll, ha what we'll have. And because of that courting and that relationship, um, as I can tell from all of us here, that she said yes. And I th for mm -hmm. investing, it's really the same way. It's really build building that relationship. And um, if the relationship is there and the communication is there, people are likely to do more business with you. Um, I, didn't, I didn't expect to share this. But I know for myself, Andy, I've had some deals that went sour. And the biggest thing was just keeping the investors aware of what was happening. Um, the biggest thing. Now, I'm not going to lie. Initially, the anxiety for me was like, oh, my God. I do not want to have this conversation with this lady. I do not want to have this conversation uh, with this guy. Tell him what happened. Oh, my goodness. And the great thing is the communication. Um, I had a, I had a client call a few weeks ago and she was talking about taxes and she basically said, Leland, um, I sold all these houses and I'm really afraid because I think that the IRS is going to take me to jail. That's what she said. And I said, Hey, guess what? As long as you're in communication, the IRS is not going to just knock on your door and take you to jail what's going to happen is if you avoid them, right, if you don't file, um, if you don't at least find out how much you really owe, if you don't really do that part, then yeah, they'll, after a while, they're going to knock on your door. And it's not because you're a bad person. It's because there was no communication. So they basically had to expect that, hey, this person wants me to come, at, come after them. And with, and with investors, when, you, when people are essentially partnering with you on a deal, or even from an alternative investing, um, secure, being, being the debt, the security against the property or the, or the project, the communication is key because they can also assume like, oh my gosh, what's happening? I haven't received any payments or, you know, they can assume all those things. And then that's when you get into to the legal issues and everything else. So communication is important. Relationships are important. And to be honest, um, one of the things that I, that I want to do in the future as we continue to grow is really just to have one or two people that would be like almost like a relationship manager, someone that is consistently writing the hand, the handwritten notes, someone that's consistently calling um, every single investor, every single client um, once a week or every other week and just giving them an update on everything that's going on. You know, for example, hey, client so-and-so we had an amazing uh meeting and and in podcast with andy mcmullen um i really think you should, you should check it out here are also some things that andy and his team have, have done as well S share your thoughts with us let, let us know what you think and something that's just as small as hey here's here's the article that uh hank wrote check it out tell us your thoughts that's still communication and that still goes a long way because when the right deal comes along and we've all been there when someone sends you something in your email and saying, hey, uh, can you invest in this? And you're like, bro, I haven't heard from you in like two years. I think that's one of the biggest mis misnomers. You hear it a lot. You, you hear it in your business, you hear it in my business, you hear it even just you know, VCs or buying business. Oh, if it's a good deal, the, the money will come. Well, if you build a relationship, yeah, maybe. But if you, you if that guy hadn't called you in three years now, however, if you were the only guy to send that particular investor a handwritten letter in the last few years, and you like the power in that, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it's it's so amazing. Like Hank, you've been in this business while successful. What? How many times have you received something like that? I mean, you, you, it's very rare. Like you might hear, I feel yeah, a gift, yeah, but yeah. That's, it's, it's next Wait. level when you receive something like that. You know? yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and again, um, early on, you were talking about relationships and, and leadership. You know, the, the, those, even today, those are rare crop qualities. Okay. But those are, and again, it's the soft skills. Because again, we were asking, we were talking earlier and I said, 
you know, typically how much does it, does it cost to play in one of your deals? And then you gave some qualifications on sophisticated versus accredited investor. Could, could you rewind that? Yeah, yeah sure. So for, for instance, the deals that were, were either when we were syndicating them, I shouldn't even use that word because it's, people, yeah. It, yeah, people don't know, but, and they shouldn't. I was talking to an investor this morning. He, he had no idea about what IR and all that stuff. Just, just give me the facts, man. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, so a sophisticated investor um, would be an investor that, that, you know, might have some experience with investing. They might not have the net worth requirement. So an accredited investor has either a million dollars in net worth or is making 200 if they're single, 300 if they're married, 1,000 a year for the last two years. And remember that, that million dollar net worth cannot include the primary residence, right. which is another thing that I think is unfortunate because it, it, it cuts off a, a group of people that could really benefit from some of these higher level, mm -hmm. potentially hedge fund deals that they would have no access to um, because they, they don't know. So what we try to do is we kind of split our deals with 506 Bravo, what they call it, which is for sophisticated and unaccredited investors, guys that maybe they want to get something, you know, they want to, they want to branch out and look at alternative investing and put in their 25 or 50,000, check it out, and then maybe become a, an accredited investor later on. And then the, the 506 Charlies are the ones that basically you have to have that net worth requirement or high earner requirement. And so, um, you know, to take it a little further, Hank, I think the partnership part of it and the people part of it is, is something that I'd like to add because I think that there's probably an audience out there that you have that's trying to do stuff on their own and they're trying to figure it out all on their own. And if they would just take a second and think, hey, I could actually partner up and mm -hmm. deliver Hank a value by either a marketing piece or underwriting piece or whatever that is in your background, sales. Um, all of these kind of tweeners, I would call us a tweener in that 2000 unit range. All those kind of tweeners need something. And so, you know, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel on your own, step into a group, forget about the LP investor or the credit investor or sophisticated investor, just figure out a way to get in there and add value and serve. And that will come back around. We've got three people on our teams that are working that way mm -hmm. right now that are just taking kind of back end and maybe some of the fees, but they've just been kicking ass because they, they want to learn instead of paying the coaching program, they want to jump in and help us mm -hmm. build it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 again, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, because, and you were mentioning sophisticated accredited investors and you write and syndicate Th those are terms that the average person knows squat about, but there are people who have enough resources to, to, to be, that want to play and will play in some type of deal making, but they don't know how to do that. And, and you mentioned the word team. Yeah. But well, one, well, one thing I want to hit though, I, I just invested in an LP deal this last week and you know what the email was explaining what, what the deal was. A one liner. It was like, <laughs> it, yeah, it was it was like a paragraph. It gave me the the, the but I, but I knew this person. I already trusted this person. I knew the market already, and I, I was you know we were talking about. I made the emotional decision before I even went back and checked the underwriting. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So so I think what happens, and I'm 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 guilty of this too because of the experience that I I have blind spots about. People are looking at this differently than you're trying to present. You know, a, a deck. That, 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 that has no value to them because it's basically what you don't understand, you don't invest. So simplify it, explain it, you know, and tease it out. And so um, if I didn't have a team, Hank, I, I, I would be sending out some of these, you know, ridiculously long decks, but I, they, they were telling me, hey, dummy, simplify. Right. Don't use the word syndication. Don't use these other terms. Just get, you're talking to your neighbor who, maybe invested in business, but he's probably successful tech in, you know, Intel or whatever, but he, he, he's, he does, he's not living in this world. So yeah. anyways, I don't know. That's good. And, and maybe even, and for those who are listening, like, well, what the heck is a deck? It's a slideshow. 
Okay. Yeah. It's just yeah. a PD, it's a slideshow that was downloaded as PDF. Okay. Thank you. Um, but you're right. People, because it's really, it's a, it's a relationship. And if they feel comfortable with you, they'll be okay. And you know, the other thing too is, is I'm not saying that people should lose any money when investing. That's not what we're saying. But the good thing is when the filing is done properly, God forbid, if something does go wrong with an investment, the, the great thing is that the investors are able to still capture that loss or those losses on their income or on their taxes. So it, it, it serves them plus and minus when necessary. So it's not a, it's never like, um, oh my goodness, I'm, you know, I lost this, this huge thing. It's, uh, you know what, the IRS will say, you know what, you attempted to circulate money in the economy. Thank you for doing that. Unfortunately, um, it wasn't as successful as it could have been, but we're still going to give you a credit because of that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lower your taxes because you went ahead and, and took that leap of faith. Can, so. I, can I say something on that? Because this the, yeah. you hit on such an important point. I had an investor that, that called me this last week. He was like, I don't know what to do, man. I've got, you know, $200,000 loss, capital gains. And, you know, I got to get it into a trade property or something like that. And the thing about real estate that you just described is that they actually give you a little bit more credit because you're hiring people, you're investing back in the economy that you've got this thing called bonus depreciation or just let's just say depreciation. Mm -hmm. And so I've got an investment. It's not mine, but, but it's a friend's investment that he can give a negative K1. So you've earned a hundred that you basically invested a hundred thousand dollars. You've earned positive cash flow. And at the end of the year, you get what they call a negative a, a K1 that says, I lost $40,000. And that $40,000, if you're a real estate professional, can, can be written off against active income. If you're not, if you're a passive investor, that can be written off against other passive losses or passive gains that you have, including capital gains. So somebody could essentially sell their property in California have $200,000 of capital gains and, and they've got basically 500K coming out in equity. Well, that 500K is actually netting them if it's a 40% negative K1, that's giving them a loss of over 200,000 that he was talking about in capital gains. So imagine that he couldn't find a property, you would still make the argument that that might be a consideration. The other thing is, with these negative K-1s, you can carry them forward to the next year and the next year and the next year. It's, it's unfair. I tell people all the time, it's like unfair. if they really understood the game of this alternative investing, it would be a revolt. And that's kind of why I feel like it's your guys' mission to we'll get this know. out to people so that they can understand how many benefits there are to it. The other thing too is just so for, for those who are listening, you're like, what's K1? K1 is, is just, it's a, it's a form, it's a tax form that says that you are part of a partnership. That's it. Okay. For anyone who's listening, who's like, I need a K1, I need a K1. Well, if you want a K1, you need to invest in, in, into alternative investments as a partner. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can reach out to Andy and he can talk to you about that. Now here's the, now here's the thing, Andy, to piggyback on what you said, the government gives more tax advantages to people or entities that keep the money per se circulating and circulation and that was something that we talked we had talked with a um with a ira a self-directed ira company uh earlier this week mm -hmm. and i use an analogy of of killing cows and things like that <laughs> and andy I'm, I'm i'm andy i know you're, you're you have a basketball background i have an agriculture background so mm -hmm. i use this analogy hanks on a laugh which was Imagine if you have if you have a farm and you, you have dairy, you have dairy cows and you have beef cows. OK, well, if you want a nice hamburger, you kill the, You kill the beef cow. Right. But that beef cow can't, you know, no more babies. Right. Nothing. Well, if you have dairy cow, you put it in the barn. You can still, you know, get some milk from, from, from that from that cow. But that cow also gives you the ability to have other calves, calves. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. What we, what the biggest issue in the economy from what I'm seeing from clients talk, I'm talking to is that they're thinking that somehow they can get a beef cow, kill the beef cow, mm -hmm. eat the beef cow, and somehow the beef cow that's been murdered and slaughtered 
it's going to reproduce another beef cow. It's like, no, mm-hmm. you want to get the cow, maybe let them graze, mate with a steer or, or possibly, you know, milk them and then let, 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 let the cow uh, produce more calves. And all I'm saying is, is this, the tax code wants you to keep that money in circulation. That's number one. Those losses, as Andy mentioned, can be carried on throughout other years. So if maybe, for example, if you plan on selling a large project in two years, because maybe that's when, that's when the market's gonna be really hot for that property, you already know, hey, I have $100,000 of a loss that I'm gonna take for that year, which means that I'll be able to pocket more of, that, or more of that profit when I sell that property in two years because I had a loss from, from, from another project. And um, Hank, Hank had mentioned earlier, we, were, we weren't recording at that time, but Hank had mentioned um, when they were seeking deals for uh, tax credits. And it's like, people, if you understand the benefits of tax credits, why don't you understand the benefits of you investing to, uh, with K-1s? Because your tax credit works kind of the same way, but just for you as, a, as an individual. Mm-hmm. You get that benefit it's like a credit, basically, or a write-off of, of that loss. Um, the last thing, because this is something that really fires me up, because people, it, it irritates me that people don't understand this. If you keep your money in your savings account, what return do you get? Zero. Zero, or 0.1, or 0.001. Okay. The government, or the IRS, whomever, everyone say it, they want that money in circulation. If they didn't want that money in circulation, you would have got higher interest rate for having it sit into your into those accounts. As a matter of fact, they give you accounts called self-directed accounts that allow you to invest in alternative investments. So if anything, that's saying, general public, wake up. We want you to have your money circulating in the economy. We want your money to, to produce jobs. We want your money to, to provide housing. And so Please, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know, hey, I have, I have my money sitting in, in, my, in my account or I know some people who just sit, who sit cash in their um, uh, the the tra- the trading accounts or the house. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just, Put had it to work. Big, I just had this big debate with my, my wife and she, 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 you know, smart and she rode with me for 20 years despite all my, 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 my failures. Right. Um, but you were talking about the sitting in a savings account collecting zero. There's so much equity in these homes now. Yep. And if you were in 2008, you remember, you know, 2010, how quickly that just basically disintegrated. It's it all that snap. equity that you think is in your house right now is completely flammable. Mm-hmm. Now, however, and in addition to that equity that you keep it in your house, it's basically losing three to 5% in inflation every year because it's sitting on your side as opposed to the bank side. So you talked about an IRA. Why can't we get that money out into an IRA or whatever that investment vehicle is? Because that equity is you, you're zero interest on that. That that money zero. has nothing to do whether your house goes up or down. down. Or whatever. That's just yep. If it goes down, it's gone. But you can get and that out. Mo- and it's your money. And it's your money. <laughs> And, and you could be investing that with return right now. And, and for some reason, I know it's, again, it's kind of part of what we talk about. What's the American dream and where should I be keeping my money? And isn't this the asset that produces most of my wealth? Um, wealth, and this is really smart. Brian Don is a, uh, he, he, he's been managing uh, storage units for, for years. And we had this conversation once and he said, look, everybody's talking about creating yield or income they're not talking about creating wealth. Creating wealth, that can produce income. Mm-hmm. Creating income is not necessarily going to produce wealth. So why don't you utilize that leverage that you're getting from the bank, you're getting from your residents to help pay your rent, you're getting from the government and tax credits and K-1s and incentives. And, and for some reason, we're not, we're not using it. So that's why I love shows like this where you guys are like, Hey, I want to, I want to just shift your mind thinking for a while because you're going to, somebody out there right now is like, oh man, that's, that's ridiculous. You don't want, but I would never take money house and yeah. I, an IRA, like, like that's something that should be for my company. But I just want you to like, let that seed, mm-hmm. but like, let it just, you know, germinate, germinate. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Agriculture. Thank you. Germinate for a little while. 
and then you you'll you'll kind of see how much that that potential is there for you. And Andy, real quick, uh, Hank, and I don't mean to cut you off. I think Hank's going to say the same thing. For anyone who's listening and you're thinking that sounds too good to be true, mm-hmm. uh, if, uh, maybe if it wasn't last week, week before last, there was an article that was released by Re- Republica. I'm not sure if you saw it too, Andy, but it's an article where it showed um, some of the tax details um, for Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, um, Jeff Bezos, and so forth, right? And someone may, may see that and say, that's wrong. And it's like, no, 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 no. These are, these are individuals who have their dollars circulating. That dollar is circulating. So if Amazon is looking to expand into Texas or Virginia or wherever else, and they plant in, in wherever, Arlington, that dollar is now circulating. Okay, that's producing jobs. They, when they purchase that building, that building was, is providing some type of, of covering for, for, or housing basically for that, uh, that employment, for, the, for, those, for that employer. So that dollar is circulating. So yes, you're gonna, get, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna obtain less of taxes. And I was talking to a guy on, on LinkedIn last week, he's a, he's a physician, and he just did not understand that. And I said, my man, listen, your earned income as a physician is literally being cut in half. Mm -hmm. It's being cut in half. And if you keep doing this, you're going to end up working until you're 80. And it's not your fault. It's just that you're not understanding that that income that they advertise to you, I don't care if it's 300, 300 grand, 500 grand, whatever, cut it in half because that's what your earned income gets. Your passive income, Come on, man! You, you, you're ac- you have access to so much more. You have so many benefits or advantages, as I say, tax advantage- advantages. You're not going to get with your active income. Period. So it does you no good to have a salary that's really high. As a matter of fact, Hank, can you tell the listeners the salary for, let's say, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Warren Buffett? Okay, Buffett. Um, I think if I remember, Buffett took a dollar. One of them took a hundred thousand. That was Buffett is a hundred thousand. Okay, um, and I think Musk and and Bezo took a dollar. A dollar salary for the year. Okay. okay. But what what people don't realize is that there those companies are in something that's called a a, a family family tr- family a trust. Family well, yeah, family trust with the family's family center. office. Yeah. But we don't and have to get we, we don't have to get into all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what happened, you know, here's, here's, you know, so you might not get that. I worked for, I worked for a law firm. The partners insisted that they would, that they would never pay an employee more than they owners would get. And they paid themselves less than a hundred, a hundred K a year. However, every quarter they took something that they called a draw. The draw was, is uh, back then, I think it was uh, taxed at like maybe 20%, 15 or 20%. Their salary was taxed at close to 40%. Or because so it's, someone... it's the income, whereas the draw is not considered income. Yep. Or someone could say distributions, right? right? Distribution. Yep. Bon- and it, once again, I'm, and I apologize to anyone who's listening. They're like, man, Leland is really talking about me. This is really messed up. I didn't say any names, but I, but I am going to say this. If you like basketball, let, let's, let's say this. If someone likes basketball and, and you really enjoy the way that Michael Jordan is, is playing, one could say, man, I wonder, you know what? I, I, you know what? I may not be Michael Jordan, but I would love to, to, to be on the court. In order, for, in order for me to be on the court, I have to learn how, how to play the game. I need to learn what a travel is. I need to learn how to dribble the ball, that kind of thing, right? So we all understand that. So if we, if everyone talks about financial independence and being debt free and being able to travel with the family and being wealthy, um, and so if you're watching someone who has obtained something, something that you want to obtain, you can either get mad, right? Be be a, be, be someone in the stands that that's that's uh, rooting for the Detroit Pistons, and you get mad and throw it, throw things at Michael Jordan, or you can say to yourself, you know what, Pistons, you guys can do that too. Because the same way, the same way that the ref calls a travel on Michael Jordan or a carry, you know what? I think he'll, I think he'll do the same thing for you guys. And all I'm saying is this: the tax code 
it doesn't, it may not seem fair, but it's a, it, the, the, their rules. And as long as everyone chooses to wake up and see how those rules can be followed, that's all you have to do. And one of the best ways to start that process is many people that are listening now, they have 401ks. You guys have our IRAs. When you take a part of that or all of it, however you want to do it, you, t- you talk to your, your spouse or your loved ones about that, you put a portion of that into self-directed accounts, you're able to look into alternative investments. You're able to have the benefits that you need. And that will actually start to put you on that process of, oh, okay, now, now I'm getting taxed le- less. Oh, wow, now I'm, I'm earning your income passively. That's what, it, that's what it's really all about, so. And the thing I want to add to that is, and so many of our investors are, are IRAs, it's so easy. It's so easy. You, you, you get it, you get advanced. You got, you, you just set it up and you can invest in the deals that you want to. It doesn't have to be real estate. It could be other alternative. And uh, you hit on a point, which I think is so important, which is the idea of this kind of camp compounding effect. And, and mm-hmm. Einstein was actually wrong about that. There being the eighth wonder of the world because he left out leveraged compounding Oof, interest, right? right? That's right. Yeah. Because we're talking about not just the compound effect, but that with, it's with other people's money that you're compounding the interest. So, yeah. uh, I mean, there's just so, there's so, there's so much opportunity for people that really want to dig in, partner with the right people. Go ahead, Hank. Sorry about that. No, no, no. I, I was going to let you finish that. That's, that's, you know, because, you know, we're not in, in TV broadcasting. I asked you a question earlier about, about your credit and investors and, and you gave some nomenclatures. What I want to do is to let people know that just because you don't have a million dollars and you're not making $300,000 a year, you can still do alternative investing, Mm -hmm. but not in the, not in the products that Andy has. He has some products that might require less, but if you can't invest with and, and play in Andy's ball field, okay, there are other fields that you can play on and still take advantage of the concept of alternative investing that, uh, that, that Leland talked about. Again, you just got to get smart people. That's all. You just got to get smart. You can't keep sitting here scratching your butts. You, you got to get up and do something. It's time to dance. You got to face the music now. You know? and Andy- so, Hank, all you have to do is pick this up, right? Yes. You pick this yeah. up and you got... You've got, you know, fun rise and cry. You could bet you could put in a thousand bucks if you wanted to, five thousand, but there's no excuse for you not learning how these deals work to just review the OM, call with questions, you know, ask what does this all mean? What is an a, a, a internal rate of return? What is an you know, ROI? All these things. There is, there's, it's not like back room where they're just hiding this information. It is on your phone, on the site. You could put a thousand bucks into crypto today if you wanted. To any other alternative investment that you want to, including yep. real estate, and so um, it, it just like what you said, Hank. It, it just can't be an ex- excuse for it. Certainly, up until now, you have no control over what your circumstances are, etc. I, I get that, but today, as you of could today, pick up this phone and make 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 that decision. Yeah, as a rat, as of rat now, rat now in the south. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And and so I want I want to say this real quick because we uh, as we're wrapping up. Um, Andy, as we're wrapping up, can you just answer the answer or say again for, for the listeners, um, echoing what Hank's question was, how can someone get started in some of the deals and what would that look like? And then if you don't mind, um, leaving them with, with any contact, contact information available. Yeah. You know, we've got this actual real good tool, um, on our site should be up. It's like a passive, passive investor tool. It's kind of a spreadsheet breaks down exactly how much you would have to invest, what kind of deals, et cetera. You know, we do have uh, what are called 506Bs, Hank, which would which mean they are for everybody. You know, okay. they, they might not be those those limits that you want. You know, you might not have your 50 or 25 grand yet ready to go. We certainly will never take anybody's last dollar. We don't want to. It's, it's terrible for businesses. It's terrible for you to be having that kind of anxiety. Um, and so that, that, that might be helpful. We also kind of have a red flag uh, uh, white paper on what people should avoid with when they're vetting operators. Um, and I, I would I would seriously reach out to me if you if you, if you learned anything from this today. 
Uh, I'm active on LinkedIn. You can find me anytime. My, uh, our website is legacy, L-E-G-A-C-Y-A-X.com. And we're constantly bringing in people to kind of train them up. No charge, no charge. We're not, we don't have a coaching program, but I think that we know that there's access to these things that some people and resources that people don't know about. And I would love to point them in the right direction. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Andy. Yeah. That's Thank awesome. you guys. That's awesome. Well, that is it for today. Andy, thank you so much for being here. This is fantastic. Seriously. I appreciate it, man. I love, I love chopping up with you guys. Hopefully we'll do it again soon. Can we come to Lafayette and have some crawdad? Yeah, man, we we'll definitely have you. Have you guys come to Lafayette? You know, because you guys won't, you won't step foot in San Diego, right? You guys don't step foot in California. So. Actually, so, yeah, uh, I, I think I think California opened up. Um, yes, they did. California opened last up. week. Oh, yesterday. Okay, yeah, I have I have family in California, so um, answer your question. Yes, my son wants to go to Legoland, so I have to make that happen. Oh, so, that's yeah. that's my town, Carlsbad. That's where my kids are going to school. So you make sure that you let me know when that happens. I'll okay. come out. I will. I will. Cool. This is right. Thanks, bad. gentlemen. Appreciate you. Thanks.